Thank you. I'm going live in one minute and 35 seconds. What's that? Hey, I think we're live. I just saw everybody pop in here all of a sudden at one time. So looks like we got a good crowd today. See if, as always, see a few, few names I recognized. Uh, Tony, hope things are good up there in Missouri for you. Hope you're doing well. Got Larry on. Talked to Larry last night a little bit. Hope you're doing well, Larry. Uh, Sharon's in with us. Who else? Deb's here. Adele's here. Both Deb and Adele live out in California. Uh, who else do we have here? Hey, Brad's here from out in New Mexico. Good to see you, Brad. Hey, if you can hear and see me and see the screen that says Introduction to Macro Photography, please uh, go ahead and type in that Q&A and make sure everybody can see and hear me okay. And, uh, and we'll go from there. I'll just wait on that just a second and we'll officially get started. I can see myself on there. Oh, okay. Here we go. Hey, Lucy. Hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah, it looks like everybody can see and hear me. Steve, hope you're doing good. All right. Awesome. Hey, I was... Uh, Stan, he's there. All right. I think Valerie, hope you're doing well. I think everybody can see and hear me, so I'll go ahead and get started. I was, uh, it, it, you know, one of the things on, on trips I talk about a lot is, uh, is when you're self-employed like I am, or whether, you, or if you're, uh, uh, I hear a lot of retirees say this is that you lose track of days. And so I never really have a good understanding of what day of the week or month it is. And then I was looking today and, and even though I knew I had the webinar today, I'm just not paying attention to the date. And so I look at the date today. And can you believe it's August 25th? And, you know, I mean, it sound like an, I'm always saying things and I tell my wife, I sound like an old man when I say that, but I can't believe how fast the year is going and, uh, and fall is right around the corner. And, uh, uh, and the good news is, I, what is that? There's 31 days in August so we're seven days, I guess, officially from pumpkin spice season. So if you're into that pumpkin spice, everything's right around the corner. So uh, we're, re we're ready to celebrate that here at uh, Hackberry Farm. And again, if you don't know me, I'm Russell Graves. Uh, see a lot of familiar faces in here, but if you're new to the webinar, uh, I, I'm coming to you live from Dodge City, Texas. We are just northeast of, of Dallas up on the Red River. I say just northeast, probably an hour and a half, two hours northeast of Dallas on the Red River. And we were able to... Uh, uh, dodge all the rain they had down there this week. We did get rain here and it's still a little muddy outside, but we got a couple inches. We didn't get the big 10 inch rain like they've got, uh, which I'm glad because when rain falls like that, as you can see, if you've been watching the news or the weather, 
it's pretty destructive when it gets that way. But anyway, glad to be here. Today's topic is the introduction to macro photography. And look, I'm going to tell you, I am, uh, uh, oh, Gene's here. Uh, Gene, I hope you're doing well. I'm not going to tell everybody the nickname that one of our guests gave you. It's a good nickname though. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I'll just tell you on the, on a continuum, on a photography continuum, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself an expert at macro photography. It's something I've been doing for a long, long time now. Uh, but it, you get into some realms of macro photography where it gets really, really complicated in terms of the terms they use and the magnification and all the technical stuff that goes along with it. If you've ever been with me before, you know, I'm a, I'm not a very technical person. I, I kind of rely more on the art of photography and just understanding what to do. It go, It's like this for me. When I get in my truck and I turn the key, I don't care what order the, the cylinders fire in. All I really care about is if I turn the key, the engine comes on and I can drive it. And that's kind of how I am with a lot of photography. I know a lot of technical things, but I don't really mire myself in that because I've learned when you're trying to learn photography, that just confuses things. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but some of y'all may have heard me say before, the one big conspiracy I do agree with is the photography educational industrial complex knows there's no money in simplicity. So they don't try to make anything simple. One of the things I try to do is make concepts like macro photography simple. So uh, on this, this presentation is exactly what it says. It's an introduction to macro photography. So don't, don't expect to get for me to wade into the weeds on get a lot of technical stuff. I'm going to tell you how I do things. Uh, I'll show you some pictures I've taken and tell you the lenses I use to take those pictures. I think 90% of the pictures I took in this presentation are taken uh, right here on Hackberry Farm, my little piece of heaven here in North Texas. And it, it's uh, it's it's amazing what you can find when you start looking for stuff. So I'm going to go through kind of tell how I do it. If you have any questions, by all means, pop them into the uh, uh, pop them into the q and I'll answer them as I go along. I always like doing that. And I always... Once I get finished, if you have some questions too, I always leave a little bit of time in the end for questions as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And so what is macro photography? If you're brand new to this concept and you don't know, I feel like I need to explain that. And here's a quote. Macro photography is a photographic technique where you use a variety of lenses for ultra close focusing capabilities to take pictures. Oh, there's a mistake there of insects, flowers and other small subjects. And who's the genius that said that? I did last night. That's the quote I came up with to define what I thought macro photography was. And I guess that's why I put my, I got my typo in there. You know, that's the crazy thing. You, I read these things a million times before we start and I always find mistakes. If you've ever done any writing in your life, you'll understand that's the case. Same way with photography too. Uh, but perfection, in my opinion, is always the enemy of the good, whether it comes in the form of writing or photography. And so one of the things you're going to learn when you take mac when you start macro photography is you're going to make a lot of mistakes, but that's okay. If, if, if you, if you try out from the beginning to be perfect, you, you miss all those good opportunities to learn and experience that journey as you go along in learning. And so that's why I always encourage you just to get out. You know, one of the things that I look for all the time when I'm walking around the farm here, uh, Rick, I, I'm gonna. I'll get into that. Your question later. Rick asked a question about lighting. So if I, if when I talk about lighting a little bit, Rick, uh, if you'll get back with me, I will. I'll answer that question. Uh, if uh, oh, back to this picture. One of the things I love doing, especially when you're kind of in that lull time of photography for me, and that's in the summertime, is going out in the mornings and looking for good subjects just right around the house, like this uh, Halloween pennant dragonfly found just literally 50 yards from my house we've got a pond right next to our house and they hang out by the ponds and they'll roost there overnight and so uh it's fun to go out and take pictures and and there's and so when, when you talk about macro photography there's a lot of different ways you can look at you can look at just close-up photography like this one or you can look at ultra close-up photography like the ones where you're seeing just every fine detail on a uh on a insect's uh, face. I haven't really got into the ultra macro photography yet where you're getting into that fine of detail. Really what I've kind of focused my efforts on is I learn it and I'll get to that point at some point. But as I focus my efforts as I'm learning the, the techniques is just number one, it's kind of like when you're starting over with wildlife, learning how to get close to insects because insects are a lot more tolerable than say a grizzly bear. But 
you, you still have your limits on how close you can get to them. And so learning how to get close, learning techniques on, on how to get them into one spot where they're easier to photograph, and then uh, learning all those different just basic macro techniques before I jump into the, to the ultra mac macro, the really close up stuff. So one of the things is you're learning macro photography, you're going to run into a lot is a one to one or life size. And that's a magnification ratio that says that if it, in the way I like to think about it in my mind is if you had the sensor of your camera out and you set a fly on top of that sensor, the size that image shows up on the sensor, if it's life size to that fly, that's a one to one ratio. So anything beyond that is, is more than life size magnification or anything less than that is less than life size magnification. For example, that's a less than a one to one ratio right there. I'll show you some pictures in a minute that equal that one to one ratio. So in other words, if you look through the camera with your eye and you look at the subject at the same time, if you're using a 50 millimeter lens, macro lens, the, the subject, if it's a one to one ratio, the subject that's in real life ought to be the same size as you're looking at through the viewfinder. And so that's, uh, that's, that's when that that's a better way of explaining the one-to-one -one life size. Now, beyond this explanation right here, I never go out and I never think about, well, is this one-to-one -one life size ratio or is it not? I just go out and take pictures and then uh, enjoy the uh, successes when I get them and learn from the mistakes when I make them. William asked the question, when does photography become macro? It, it's when you're really trying to get to that more closer to that one-to-one -one ratio is kind of how I define it, William. There's a lot of people that define it a lot of different ways, but ultimately it's it's when you're trying to get, again, get that picture to that one-to-one -one ratio. When you can take pictures of stuff that small, then it, it appears life-size when it's just magnified to 50 millimeters on the back of your camera. So with that said, here's what I've learned so far. There's a lot of advantages of macro photography. Gives you a chance to explore some additional, an additional photographic genre. Uh, and that's one of the key things for me. I, I, I've been blessed, and some of you guys may have heard me say this before, but I've been blessed that I have a hobby that also is my livelihood. So uh, when I have time off where I'm not taking pictures, where people pay me to take pictures, whether it's a magazine or whether it's a commercial client or whether it's Backcountry Journeys, when I'm not leading uh, educational trips for backcountry journeys, when I'm not being paid to take pictures, uh, what I do for a hobby is I go take pictures. And so it gives me just an additional thing to take pictures of. And uh, it's, it kind of helps, helps enlighten me a little more to the photographic arts. Uh, it's a pretty inexpensive genre to explore. Uh, you know, everybody knows if you get into wildlife photography, for example, even the, uh, even the, the, the cheapest of telephoto lenses are probably still going to cost more new than all the money I've got invested in my, in my set of four macro lenses that I use on a regular basis. Uh, so it's pretty inexpensive genre to explore. It's not, you know, it's not a $12,000, uh, 500 or 600 millimeter F4. It's, it's all pretty inexpensive. And I'll tell you how I get to the inexpensive in, in, in a little bit. Uh, Andrew says, when you say a 50 millimeter macro lens, is that the same as that nifty 50 lens? No. So, and, and I'm speaking in Canon terms here. So Canon, and I'll show you the lens in a minute. Can make, makes a lens. A lot of people call a nifty 50. It's a 50 millimeter F 1.8 lens, but they also, I don't know if they still make it or not, but they used to make another lens. That's a, uh, 50 millimeter F 3.5 macro. And when I said 50 millimeter macro, that's kind of what I meant to try to explain that one to one ratio. Uh, dang it. there's subjects everywhere. Therefore, you don't have to travel far. I mean, literally, with the exception, I'll show you the pictures that weren't taken here. With the exception of just two or three pictures on this whole presentation, I took everything in this presentation within probably two or 300 yards from my house. It's just getting out and walking around and looking for stuff. And that's the key thing. And I'll remind you of that in a minute. It's just a look. Uh, you don't have to travel far. And then you don't necessarily need exotic equipment. I'll, uh, I mean, you can buy some exotic equipment. Again, when you get to the ultra macro where you're really trying to do fine detail at a really, really tiny level, uh, you can buy some more complicated equipment like the bellows attachments and uh, some of the other in the, some of the other specialized macro lenses. But just to do simple insect photography or amphibian photography or flower photography, like we're talking about, you absolutely don't need any exotic equipment. And then the good news is most all that equipment that you buy is multi-use. You can use it for a lot of different things. Uh, 
it, it's not just relegated to just shoot macro photography. In fact, one of the favorite lenses I use uh, for product photography that I do from time to time, or is sometimes I'll use it for uh, uh, portrait photography is that 50 millimeter macro lens I have. And the reason why I like using it is because the bokeh, the out of focus areas of that lens, because the lens is manufactured a little bit different, look a lot different than that, say that nifty 50 that I use. So uh, that's the cool thing. It's not, it, even though it'll focus close, it won't just focus close. It'll focus to, out to infinity. So I end up using those lenses for a lot of different uses. And uh, here's the most important thing, I think, when it comes to photography. It keeps you out in the field shooting and it refines your photographic techniques. Whether you're taking pictures of landscapes or wildlife or stars or people or grandkids or anything else, exposure and aperture and ISO and those three basic components of a good exposure, it all works the same as it does with macro. And so anything that you can do or I can do or we can do to improve our understanding of the camera and our understanding of lighting situations and lighting scenarios and how they work, anytime you get a chance to work on that even more, uh, that that's a good thing to do. And, and you know, and, and let's say you live in an apartment, doesn't necessarily have to be in the field. You can go to a local park or you can, you can, uh, uh, have a, have a roof, uh, 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 a, uh, garden out on your deck and, uh, you can get pictures there. I, in fact, a number of these pictures that I took for this presentation, I took over the past week or so, and I took them out in my, out in our vegetable garden, just right beside our house. I mean, 30 yards from here i'm looking out the the door window towards the garden right now and so it and that's the most important things it just keeps you out in the field and it keeps you refining your techniques and learning more and more about the camera and for that one reason in my opinion that's reason enough to go buy some sort of macro lens and start exploring from there and so another thing i've learned is use a variety of lenses and techniques i mean for me that's the beauty of it is trying to solve those photographic problems and trying to understand how do i how do I uh, take a picture of this animal and get as good a picture as I can of it and it have some context behind it, like in this grasshopper here? Uh, you know, I, I, one of the things I've been doing, I've got a wetland on my property and I've been spending time trying to document all the species of every kind of living thing that lives in that wetland, including the plants and, uh, and uh, animals there. I've got, and speaking of which, you got a really cool... I'll share that link with you at some point in the future, but I've got a really cool uh, article coming out in a magazine here in Texas uh, in October. I just saw the layouts a day or two ago about all the things I'm doing here on my property to try to increase it for wildlife production, how to take it from a worn out hay field to something where there's wildlife everywhere. And so one of the things I'm doing, not only from an aesthetic standpoint, but a baseline standpoint is trying to photograph all of those uh, bugs and animals just to figure out what was here first and figure out what I'm going to see later. So I use a variety of lenses and techniques. And so one of the things I try to do is figure out, it, like I do with big wildlife, is how can I get as close to the animal as I can, still provide some context to show where it lives, but get as close as I can to the animal and, uh, and still get a good picture of it. Lori, I'm going to get to your question in a minute. She asked if I use a tripod or handheld. I'll get to that question in a minute. And so here's what I use. And uh, th this lens right here, I'll tell you the story about where I discovered this sort of technique of, uh, of macro photography. I judged a, a, a photography contest last summer down in South Texas. It's called Wildlife in Focus Photography Contest. And the cool thing about that contest is they'll partner photographers up with landowners. And it's, a, it's like a six-month period that the photographers have to go out to a landowner's property and photograph wildlife. And so as we're going through the various categories and I'm judging these pictures, me and two other judges, as, as we we're judging these pictures, uh, I keep see, seeing this one photographer who has taken pictures of like dung beetles with a big ball of poop underneath it. But the cool thing is she's right up on the dung beetles, but you can see kind of the area where the dung beetle lives. And so I'm thinking, I didn't even know there was a such thing as wide angle macro because it's clearly macro, but it's clearly wide angle too. And so when I got home, I did a little research. And that's when I found this company. It's a Chinese company called Laowa. They make all kinds of exotic macro lenses. But the one that I found worked well was this 15 millimeter macro. I mean, it'll focus all the way to where something will touch the lens. 
But what it'll do is it'll give you that wide angle view so you can kind of see a little more of the habitat it's in. Instead of just a close up like portrait shot of whatever, like I would say that's a that's a portrait shot of that grasshopper. But using this lens here, if you can get close enough to the grasshopper, you can show the grasshopper and where he lives and then you can see the background in behind it. It's just a, a wide angle macro. Now the, the uh, limitations of this lens is uh, it does not have autofocus. You have to manually focus, which, which if you're using a mirrorless camera, I know Canon's have it, uh, but a lot of these cameras will have a focusing aid that you can turn on to help you manually focus. But, uh, uh, and I'll explain to you in a minute why, why that autofocus isn't necessarily a, uh, an advantage sometimes when you do macro photography, but it also has a manual aperture. So it's an all manual lens. But that's not a bad thing because it's still you're still pretty easy to get get things in focus. And then that uh, who was it that asked a while ago? Is the uh, uh, oh is Andrew? So here's the 50 millimeter lens that I use, and it also has a life size adapter. So I mentioned that term life size earlier. If uh, it, when you put this adapter on, and this is assuming you're using a full frame sensor because this lens was actually made for a film camera. Uh, you can, uh, it, it'll, it'll actually convert it where you can shoot pictures at a one-to-one -one ratio. If you notice there, you can see that in the yellow at the top, that's showing the ratio it shoots there. It's a one to four. So it's not a magnification ratio at that point. It's a, it's 25 less times, 25 times less than, uh, uh, life size and so that's the that's the technical part i don't really get into because i confuse myself when i start thinking about that a lot so i use this canon 50 millimeter macro with a life size adapter i probably use this lens the least of all my macro lenses and just because like a 50 millimeter think about using a 50 millimeter lens to take a picture of an elk i mean you're gonna have to be awfully close to get a frame filling picture and that's the same way with this it would pro i use this more when i'm doing kind of still life stuff shots things aren't going to run away or fly away from me is when i'll use this one a lot i do a lot of agricultural work and i'll show you a lens that i shot i'll show you a picture in a minute i shot with this lens of an agricultural subject and so uh but that's what i use it for is mainly static stuff that's not going to run away and then this is my newest lens this is an older lens they don't even make this anymore but i, I bought this one online uh the other uh, i just got it the other day it's a tamron 180 millimeter macro because one of the things I haven't accomplished yet, right out in front of my house, I've got about a one acre pollinator garden and it's all dormant now. Everything is gone to seed, but in the springtime, it's full of wildflowers and we have all kinds of bees and hummingbirds and everything else flying around out there. And one of the things I've, I've had in mind, and I saw a shot like this on Instagram of a, just a really tight shot of a honeybee just flying right at the camera. And so in order to do that, I think I need this lens because the, the hundred mill the the hundred mill eighty millimeter that that term is what you think it is. Uh, it's it's not anything exotic in in macro. The only thing that's exotic is the fact that it does say macro, so it'll focus closer than your typical seventy to two hundred millimeter lens will. And so, well, let me go backwards real quick. So let me put some price tags on these things for you guys. This fifteen millimeter macro, I bought it new, and this lens cost me I think four hundred and thirty bucks is what it cost. Valerie asked the question, are you using R5 with these lenses? Yes, I, I am. Of course, you've got the adapter. These are all for the Canon EF mount, but uh, I use the adapter. And by the way, I, I'm mentioning Canon so much. I'm not advocating Canon. It's just what I use. But Nikon, you can do the same thing with. Olympus, you can do the same thing with it. Uh, you can do the same thing with, with a lot of different camera manufacturers and find the right lenses. So this Lyle 50 millimeter macro, 430 bucks. And I'm guessing on this, but this Canon 50 millimeter macro with the life size adapter. Now you can buy them separately, but if you bought the 50 millimeter lens, I want to say that's a 230, 240 bucks uh, used in the life size adapter, maybe a hundred dollars used. It's just not that expensive. And then uh, this Tamron 180 millimeter macro, I bought it used for $380 a couple of weeks ago. Now I, I this isn't a pitch for kehcamera.com because I know there's a lot of used camera manufacturer or used camera dealers, but I bought from keh for a long time. I've dealt with them for probably twenty more than twenty years now. Ever since I was shooting film camera, that's how I'd always upgrade is buy used stuff. And so me, I have no problem with buying used lenses. 
their grading system, and I and I speak to them again. I I, I haven't dealt with KEH or Adorama or any of the other places that sell you stuff, so I can't speak to them. But I can tell you with KEH, their grading system starts with like uh, like new, and it's got like like new plus, like new minus, excellent plus, excellent minus. I think the next one is bargain plus, bargain minus, and then ugly. The only ones I try to steer away from are the ones that listed as ugly because they may have marks on the glass. But if it's got a few marks where people have used it on the lens barrel or something like that, it, that doesn't really bother me. As long as the glass is clean and the uh, and the uh, lens operates, that's all I really care about. And so if you buy an excellent lens from KEH, you you would swear it's brand new when you get it. And plus, they offer a little bit of a, of a warranty on their lenses they sell you, and you can buy an extended warranty on top of that. So I've always been comfortable buying used equipment, and that's how I got into all my macro stuff, with the exception of this Lyle 15 millimeter just because that lens was so new at the time you couldn't uh you couldn't uh buy that one new. So I bought that one new, bought that used, bought that one used. Uh just had another question. Joan asked, will this webinar be available to review later? Yeah, if you sign up for this webinar, then as soon as the recording's available, I think the system automatically sends you a recording. Uh uh, Joan. And then Jerry asks, is the life size adapter the same as an extension tube? No, that life size adapter actually has some optics in it. And I'm about to get to extension tube. So if you've never heard that term before, I'll explain what that is. And then bingo extension tubes. So this was my, using these was my first foray into macro photography. Now I'm no optical physicist, so I can't tell you why this works the way it does, but these extension tubes, they look like a teleconverter but they have no glass in them at all. I mean, in fact, they're like a donut. You can stick your finger through them. And so I've got two different extension tubes. This one is a 25 millimeter one. I've also got a 12 millimeter one. You can use the 12, you can use the 25, or you can stack them. But essentially, the thicker the extension tube becomes, the closer you can make a lens focus. And the advantage to these guys are that you can, uh, that you can put these on like a lens that's not a macro and give it macro capabilities. I use the, my extension tubes a lot with uh, my my 70 to 200 millimeter lens. And even with my 16 to 35 millimeter lens, before I got that Laowa, I could put it on my wide angle lens and make these and make uh, make that wide angle lens at 16 to 35 work like a, a macro. Bob asked me where I got the lenses from. K, like Karen, E-H, like Harold.com is where I got all my used stuff from. And so these extension tubes, if you bought Canon, and I looked on b &H right before I came on this webinar, these are like 112 bucks uh, for this one if you if you buy it new. I'm not sure what the use cost is. I, I figure probably 50, 60 bucks. But there's also third-party manufacturers that make these. You can buy a whole set of three in different thicknesses for like $75. Again, you can buy them... Uh, I think they go 12 millimeter, 25 millimeter. I want to say the thick, they make a thicker one that's 33 millimeter and you can mix and match all of them or use them all together to really increase how close that your lenses will focus. If you follow the uh, Backcountry Journeys tribe, you'll see I put a post on there yesterday about this Rufus Hummingbird that I photographed in my front yard where they're usually not supposed to be. And this Rufus Hummingbird, I shot it with my 500 millimeter lens but because those birds are so so small, I wanted to be able to get closer to that life size ratio. And so because they're so small, I used a, an extension tube on my 500 millimeter lens to take this picture right here. And Sandy says, can you use the tubes for any lens? Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, on my lenses, you can. You can use them for any one of them. Uh, and Brad says, the extension tubes change the depth of field of the lens? Uh They probably do to some degree, Brad. The the thing that's going to affect the depth of field more than anything is is your your magnification level and then how close your background is to the subject and all. Like like the background here from where this uh, hummingbird landed, the how I get those real soft, creamy backgrounds like that is that background is probably 150 yards away. There's a row of trees along the creek behind where this is, so it's pretty open between here and there, and so you don't get any of the you don't get any of the uh, other trees. Now you can see on the left, there's a dark, little darker green blob and that's a tree that's closer to the line of trees back at my Creek. And so that's how you get that. But typically 
I don't, I can't answer for sure, but I, in my experience, just thinking about it, I don't know that it affects the depth of field of the lenses all that much at all. Great questions coming in, by the way. So the picture on the left here, that's of a cotton seedling coming up. Actually, I'll, I'll wait into the weeds a little bit like this because you know how much I like stories, but I was doing a, doing a, 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 uh, a shoot for a magazine for an agriculture magazine and it was something about west texas cotton i don't remember what it was but anyway i wanted a picture of a cotton seedling and i wanted to be able to get it at, at eye level so what i did on that was i photographed uh i i got one of those seeding trays like you use in a uh in a uh, uh greenhouse filled it full of potting soil and topsoil made my mixture planted a few cotton seeds in it and then lit it artificially with a light just uh I use one of those clamp on lights, but instead of a, uh, instead of a, uh, uh, a regular incandescent bulb, I bought a, a, a bulb for a, a greenhouse, a plant bulb. It's at 5,000 Kelvin. It's daylight color. And so I, I put it above it as to backlight it a little bit as if it were the sun. And then not only did I take this one picture, I put my camera on the intervalometer. When I start first started seeing the seed come up, I turned my camera on and let it take pictures for an entire day. So I've got a time lapse of the seed actually emerging and coming up. But then each one of those time lapse or a single picture, I was able to, to get a picture like that out of. But I use that 50 millimeter lens for that shot there because I was literally six inches away from that cotton seedling uh, to take that shot. The picture in the upper right was uh, of a uh, well, that was with my 16 to 35 millimeter with with the extension tube on it. I shot that in Alaska last summer, a year ago. And so I really wanted to get a shot of the fireweed, but I wanted to have all the, you know, a little bit, it, this, it did change the depth of field on this a little bit, Brad, as I think about it, but I wanted to have a little bit different depth of field look and be able to get closer to that subject because I think natively you can only be like a foot and a half away from the, from a, from a, uh, a subject with that 16 to 35, but with that, with that extension tube added and I used the 12 millimeter extension tube, with that extension tube added to that 16 to 35, I was able to focus like four inches away and compose it where you can see that field of fire weed kind of blending away. And then the, uh, and I wanted the background out of focus. So the mountain in the background uh, would kind of go softly out of focus, really kind of, you could see the uh, environment the flowers live in, but really the, the star of the show was that one fire weed that was sticking up higher than the rest of them. That was kind of my thought there. And then, uh, on the lower right here, that was shot with the 15, 50 millimeter lens with the uh, uh, with the uh, life size adapter, and that's actually the inside of a cotton bloom. And so I used uh, I can't remember who asked the question later earlier. I mean, I used an external flash to, that I placed outside of the uh, outside of the uh, flower to kind of illuminate it from the inside because those, those leaves are a little bit a little bit translucent. That picture is a good example of something that looks better when you see it life size, but you can see the details of the pistols and the stamens and all the reproductive parts of that cotton flower. So this is another shot with that, with my 500 millimeter lens and, and really thinking of creative ways to use and do macro photography. I was able to get one to one life size ratio with my 500 millimeter lens and still maintain a working distance because I don't know if you've ever tried to photograph dragonflies before but they're super skittish or the ones here are super skittish so i needed a way to 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 have some working distance where i wouldn't crowd them too much but still try to try to get where they look life size when you look at them and to accomplish that i just used my 500 millimeter lens and put the 25 millimeter uh extension tube on it to make that thing where it'll focus like up to i think it'd focus up to about two or three feet once i did that and so i don't know if technically that makes it a macro lens but for the sake of this and talking about extension tubes, I call it a macro lens. And so the green tree frog that's peeking around the switchgrass there on the left, I used a, a 70 to 200 millimeter lens with the extension tube on that as well, the 25 millimeter extension tube. And that allowed me to focus up to about six inches away to get that shot. And then uh, I've been seeing, I'll brag on Stan, a little bit but stan's been posting some he just got a macro lens and been posting some great stuff on uh online that i've been seeing and this this picture of this spider 
uh, in the upper right reminds me of a picture I saw of his that's backlit where you can see the web a little better. And then, of course, you know, even though tarantulas are big spiders, to get a good picture of them, you still got to be relatively close. And that's – that's I used a – I used a uh, the same – on all three of these, I use a 70 to 200 millimeter lens with a with an extension tube attached to all of them. Uh, Mark says manual focus. I'm going to get to that in just a little bit, Mark. I'm going to answer that question. I know we've had a couple other questions like that. Uh, Dick, uh, this is a, is a great question here as we're talking about extension tubes. Dick asks, why would you choose a 25 millimeter extension tube rather than a different? How do you decide with which extension tube to use? So... The extension tube will, will will influence how close that lens can focus. So the thinner the extension tube, the further what the more space you need to focus. So the, the thicker extension tube you use, like a 25 millimeter, will allow me to focus that lens closer. Usually I kind of ride around, Dick, with the uh, with the 12 millimeter on because that works in most places, but I've always got the other one with me. And uh, in fact, as, as an aside, I Every backcountry journey trips I've ever been on, I take those extension tubes with me because I never know when I'm going to use them. And it's a cheap way to turn any one of those lenses into a macro lens without having to bring another lens along with, with you when, when space is a, is a consideration. But usually, what again, what I do, depending on how, how, uh, how close I need to get to that subject to get the composition that I, that I kind of want to get in my mind, it, it just kind of relegates on which extension tube I use, whether I use the 12, 25, or or both of them stacked together. Uh, I had another thought I was going to make, and I just forgot what it was. Anyway, I'll think about it in a minute. So hope that answers your question, Dick. Uh, so let's talk about macro on the cheap. Let's say you're not ready to go out and spend three or four hundred dollars. And so how can you, how can you get started in macro, whenever uh, with with the equipment that you already have, and maybe where you have to spend a little bit of money. One of the things you can do is, re is use reversing rings. I used to have these, but I, I haven't used them in a while. Uh, but what a reversing ring is, it's a ring that screws into the filter thread of an existing lens and it allows you to mount that lens backwards on your camera body. Those things, I looked last night on Amazon, they cost about $10 to buy. Now, you, you lose, unless it's a manual lens, you lose the ability to use your aperture and you lose the ability to autofocus because those cameras are focused by wire. They've got to have an electrical connection to the camera to be able to do what they do. But in that case, your focus becomes you, where you're just moving in and out to try to attain focus. But that works pretty well. When I used to shoot film, I had a setup like that. I've just never got it uh, for my for my 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 digital cameras. Not for no other reason other than I just haven't thought about it. But that's a good way to. Uh, to get started for ten dollars in macro photography, that's also a good way. If you've got like that, like Canon, a lot of cameras come with that. Like a, what is it? Like an eighteen to no? What what is that lens? It's like a some kind of weird focal length, like fifty five to one hundred five. Or I was gonna say eighteen to one hundred five, but that doesn't sound right. Or eighteen to eighty, something like that. They come with that kit lens, and that's a good way to use that kit lens. Uh, if it's just sitting in a drawer somewhere, go buy your reversing a uh, reverse mount adapter and then try that out for macro. Ten dollars, you'll be shooting macro pictures. Takes a little bit of practice, but again, that's the whole reason why we go out and take pictures is for the practice anyway. And then another cheap way, and that was really my first foray into macro photography, is using extension tubes. Uh, and like I said earlier, the you could buy Canon extension tubes for 100, 150 bucks, brand new. You can buy third party ones, seventy five dollars. You can probably go to KEH right now and buy them used. I don't know how much they would be, but extension tubes are a great way as well. You don't lose any optical quality of those expensive lenses you bought. It just creates, for whatever reason, creates the ability for that lens to be able to focus a whole lot closer than you could normally. And then Andrew asked, "Do the extension tubes work with your mirrorless camera?" Yeah. So with the extension tubes, uh, with the extension tubes I use, the Canon ones, I don't lose any autofocus capabilities or aperture control capabilities. So it's just a seamless wireless connection from the body to the lens. It just allows that, that lens to focus even closer. Now, here's what I don't know. And you may discover this. 
and I and if someone can answer this, tell me why it does it this way. But when I whenever I'm shooting my 70 to 200 millimeter lens with extension tubes, the focus ring becomes less useful, and re, and then the zoom rings is what mainly I use to focus with, and it it will zoom some, but it changes the way the lens zooms. It doesn't break the lens or anything, but optically, the way that camera translates light to that, or the way the lens translates light to that camera, optically something changes. Now, I don't care enough to know to 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 uh, want to go study it and, and make a dissertation on why that happens, but the fact is just know it happens, and so instead of using your focus ring to obtain autofocus, it, it you can use the, uh, the, the zoom ring to do the same thing. And so Pat asked, are you shooting a manual mode? Uh, well, I'll go ahead and answer that question. Most of the time, no. I mean, if you've ever been with me, and the way I shoot wildlife and any other scene is I, I primarily shoot an aperture priority. And then I use exposure compensation to uh, adjust accordingly as I'm shooting. But every now and then, if it's a static subject like, uh, like that cotton plant, I did shoot that in manual mode because I wouldn't worry about anything moving and nothing, the light wasn't going to change and it was going to stay the same. So, and I, and nothing against manual mode. I just use after priority because that's what I'm, that's kind of how I learned in the beginning. And I can work really, really quick to obtain proper exposure by using after priority and just adjusting the, expo the exposure compensation. And then another good way we already talked about that. Just go buy used equipment. I mean, uh, Again, I, I think about my camera equipment and and I've got a lot of stuff. I've got five Canon flashes and a wireless flash controller and cords and all kinds of lenses. I mean, lenses all the way from, from 11 millimeters to 500 millimeters and, and literally a ton of lenses in between. Uh, I got like six or seven camera bodies. And with the exception of, of uh, camera bodies, that's about the only thing I'll buy new. With the exception of maybe one or two lenses, every other lens that I own and every other piece of equipment I own, I bought it used. And for me, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of me being cheap. But if you've ever owned a business before, you know this to be true, that when you own a business, you can't control how you can't ever control exactly how much you make, but you can almost always control how much you spend. And so I buy my cameras like I buy my, my trucks. I don't mind buying something that's been gently used as long as it still works and I can squeeze the, the value out of it because here's the crazy thing about camera equipment. You want to, you know, we hear the story about how fast cars, uh, about how fast cars depreciate when you drive them off the lot. I've got one camera body. It's a Canon 1D Mark III. My son uses it. If you've seen my son with me on a, on a backcountry journey strip, that's the body he's using. It's it's still a great camera. It works fine. He's won literally every photography competition he's ever entered on this on the local, regional, and state level with that camera. And it cost me forty three hundred dollars when I bought it new. I looked on KEH the other day just to see what the trade in value was because I, I ended up sending that camera to a new friend of mine in, in Botswana uh, and going to give my son another camera. But anyway, I, but I had to declare the value of that camera body. $90 is what the declared value of that camera body is based on what KEH would give for that camera today. And so from a business standpoint and from a practical standpoint, I'd rather go out and spend 800 bucks on a lens as opposed to $2,500 for lens. And the only thing is it may not be as clean as it is coming out of the box. Uh Dolly, here's a good tip, Sarah. She says, our Carolina Nature Photographers Conference, which is held annually, has a place where people sell and swap and a great place to pick up items with great nature photographers. It covers North Carolina and South Carolina nature photographers. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice, Dolly. And uh, and some of my equipment I bought, I bought like that, where I just had a friend who, uh, who uh, would use something for a while and not use it anymore. And I'd buy it from him, but I'm, I'm an advocate of used equipment. And, uh, and if we're talking about being green, that's the ultimate way of being green is just buy something used. Another thing, and I've, I've never really used these before because I always was concerned a little bit about the quality, but 
they still make these, but you can buy actual like diopter close-up filters for the front of your lenses where they'll just add additional magnification and make your make your lenses where uh, they'll focus closer. Some people swear by them. I don't know that much about them just because I've never really used them, but you can buy those and they're they're relatively inexpensive as well. And then here's the crazy thing, and I've done this a time or two, but it, it, and it's not a camera like you think about a camera, but it is a camera. But you're, if you've got a flat, flatbed scanner at home and you want to do some good nature study of leaves or dead insects, flatbed scanner works amazingly well because what you get is a super high resolution image out of those flatbed scanners. And then you can go, you can take that image into your photo editing software and be able to, to do whatever you want to with it, you know, like you would a traditional photo. The only difference is it's going to either shoot that on, on white if you've got the lid down or what I've done before is covered it in a black cloth. So when it when it when it scans it, it's got a black background, but it's a it's amazing resolution when you look at it that way. And it's just a fun way to scan. And it's a good rainy day project to go scan leaves or or bugs or whatever else that you, that you find interest in. And, and believe it or not, you may have never thought you'd hear about using a flatbed scanner as a camera, but they're, they're cheap. And they're uh, and a lot of people already have them in their house, and they're just super easy to use. So a few more macro picks. Uh, again, to get to be able to get detail like you I, I, you did in the in the basket flowers on the right to, when they're backlit, you just none of the lenses I have would focus that close. So using extension tubes and making that forcing that lens to focus closer, I could have got closer than this. But to get the composition I wanted, that's what I was striving for there. And 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 that and the uh, the 180 millimeter lens macro I've got is is uh, indispensable for pictures of like that cicada there on the left of being able to get closer to it. I've been trying to get closer pictures of cicadas than that. Uh, I've been trying to get closer to cicadas than that, but they're they're pretty skittish. I know of some tricks that you can do to get to get closer, but. Uh, you know, if you read some old school books, they'll tell you to take an insect and, and put it like inside of a cooler for a little bit to cool it off. But I just kind of like leaving them be. I don't really like doing that. And so I never have really done it. And so I don't like doing that. Uh, Tim asked the question, do you have a general rule of thumb for picking a beginner aperture rather than charts or formulas? Yeah, my rule of thumb, uh, Tim, is I start at about F5.6. And it's kind of like licking my finger and sticking it up to the wind to see which way the wind's blowing. I'll take the picture and look at it. If I need more depth of field, I'll dial it in. If I don't need more depth of field, you know, I, if I like the way it looks like it is, I'll, I'll leave it like it is. So again, that goes back to what I said in the beginning. I don't, you can, you can get super technical with this kind of photography. I'm not the guy to, to, to talk that and do that. I look for practical solutions and practical answers. And more importantly, practical ways that when I go out again, because I'm not shooting macro photography every single day, it's just one of the tools in my tool bags I want to be able to do when I'm ready to do it. It's just less for me to remember when I go out to take pictures. This is my friend, the spider that's been hanging out with me all summer. So if I, when I go out to the barn and work, this, uh, this spider has been living on the windowsill when I open up the window in the morning. So the, you're looking north out across Hackberry Farm there. And uh, I use that Lyle with that 15 millimeter lens that I talked about earlier to shoot this picture where you can see the spider. And I'm, I'm maybe an inch away from that spider when I took a picture of it, but you can see the spider there and it's uh, and you can see the the uh, the the fields and the trees back off in the distance. And that's what I like about that 15 millimeter macro lens is ability to do that. The background's kind of fuzzy, Mark, but the but the spider is uh is pretty sharp. And then more shots taken with the, the uh, extension tubes, just to be able to get as close as I can to these subjects, like that fiddleback fern or this or the green tree frog. Brad says, "Love that great shot." I'm I'm not sure which picture you're talking about, Brad, but I appreciate it, whichever one you're talking about. And so here's a few tips for you. Here's what I've learned so far. Shoot early in the morning because the dew and the cool weather will slow down the bugs. That's the best time I've found to take pictures of any kind of macro stuff is I'll get up in the morning. Like this morning, we had a really, really heavy dew on, on the ground. I didn't walk out. I didn't look for anything to take pictures of. But just, you know, when we're starting to get in that time of year 
when for a lot of us, you're having those mornings when they're, when they're pretty humid. And so, again, before the, everything dries out and warms up, uh, the animals are fairly lethargic, or the bugs are fi- fairly lethargic at that time. Uh, will the extension tubes work on the adapter ring for the R5, Stan asked? I think they will, Stan. Uh, if, if you're ta- I've got the, I've got just, I don't know the model of it. I've got that simple adapter where you, it doesn't have the ring that you can turn on that, uh, Stan. But I'm assuming they'd work on both of them. Okay, so Lucy says she's a little confused about the extension tube and the logic of adding it. So the extension tube will make lenses of yours that aren't macro be able to focus like like a macro lens. So, uh, I'm, so if you if you had that. I'm trying to think. I think you've got that 150 to 600 millimeter lens. So with that lens, you've got a minimum focusing distance of like 10 or 12 feet with that lens. If you add a couple of extension tubes, you can make that lens focus down to a foot or two just to be able to get a lot closer with it. So that's the point in extension tubes. The extension tubes, there's no point in adding it to a macro lens. The point of extension tubes are adding those to the existing lenses you already have that aren't macro to give them more of a macro capability. I hope that makes sense, Lucy. So shoot early in the morning because all those things will be in your favor. Always be on the lookout. And that's the thing I've learned too, because, you know, as I'm walking through my field or walking around our garden or something, I'm, my eyes are kind of high. I'm looking for something else. But if you take the time to look, uh, you'll always notice that there's something there looking back at you. So uh, someone asked this question earlier, and this was going to get to this. Use a reflector or an off-camera flash to be able to feel light back in. Now, a reflector may be a, a, a five-in-one reflector like you can buy. In the case of my spider here, I use a sheet of notebook paper. So the, the, it's actually reflecting the early morning uh, light coming up uh, from the sun. And I just put the paper off to the left of this picture and reflecting light back into that to b- balance the light in the spider with the background. So that's all I use there. So anything that reflect light will work. You know, in a pinch, our hands will work because they're re- a reflective surface. And so I just use a piece of notebook paper that's right off camera there, reflected the light back into it and uh, just did it quick and easy and, and, uh, and simple. Now, when we're talking about flashes earlier, a guy had mentioned loom cube. So loom cube is just a little bitty. It's, it's, I don't know, maybe an inch square. It's just a little cube that has a pretty powerful LED light in it. Those are great as a constant source of light, and those will work. Uh, those would work good for uh, for doing macro photography. I haven't used them that much for macro photography, but I, no other reason than I've got a little flash bracket set up for mine. Some when I use sometimes. Now, off camera flash is important because if you put your camera, your flash on top of your camera that light's pointing straight out. It won't necessarily point down right in front of the lens. And so off-camera flash may be as simple as buying a cord to connect your flash to your camera. Now, when it comes to flash stuff, and we could do a whole other webinar about using flash in outdoor photography, and that may be a good idea to use one. But when we're talking about flashes for uh, on cameras, when we're talking about using flashes with cameras, a lot of people get intimidated by that. But these flashes now are so smart. If you use the TTL, the through the lens metering, it actually happens in a split second. You can't tell it, but the uh, but the uh, the flash will actually fire a pre-flash that the camera registers and comes up with the proper exposure, and then it fires the whole thing over again, and then and then fires the flash when your when your shutter opens up. And so, it's pretty intuitive. It's not that hard to use. Uh, there's some adjustments like anything else in photography. You may have it overexposed or underexposed, and there's some techniques you can use to soften the light, like using a little portable softbox and things like that. But if you ever if you ever wanted an excuse to try to off-camera flash and experiment with it, macro is a good way of doing that too. Yeah, so Lee asked the question, can you get closer to a subject with a 100-millimeter lens versus a 50-millimeter lens? You can. So if you think about that one-to-one ratio, Let's assume for art, for just simplicity's sake, that you have to be an inch away with a 50 millimeter lens to achieve a life size ratio of that bug or whatever picture, whatever animal you're taking a picture of. 
with a hundred millimeter lens, you may can be three inches away. And with the 180 millimeter lens, you can maybe can be a foot away to achieve that same one to one ratio. So it's just like when you're taking pictures of a wildlife, the smaller the lens, the closer you've got to be to it to get a frame filling image of that subject. And so the telephotos like they help us in wildlife, Lee, just allows you to be back further and get a frame filling image of that subject. That's the same way it works in macro. So that's why I bought the 180 millimeter macro to be able to back off of some of these skittish animals and get pictures of them without having to be just, you know, less than an inch away from them. It's a great question, by the way. And this is with anything, but I say it over and over again, when you're playing on the house money with digital photography and it's so cheap to do, take lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures. I went out and shot pictures in my garden a couple of days ago. I found out the more pictures I take, the luckier I get because a lot of those pictures get thrown away because your depth of field all of a sudden, even if you're shooting at F-16, your depth of field all of a sudden with macro becomes razor thin. And if, the, if that bug moves a little bit or you move a little bit, then your focus is completely off and uh, and it may be a little bit fuzzy. You can recover some of that using some of the, like like the Sharpen by, by Topaz, but I always like to get the pictures right in the first place. So take lots of pictures. I put my camera on burst mode. So like if a, uh, if a, a little beetle comes into, into, into frame and I've got it in focus, I'll just shoot lots and lots and lots of pictures and, uh, and, and hope I get lucky. And then sometimes now we've had a couple of questions about autofocus. Uh, sometimes the, uh, autofocus will try to hunt a lot when you're using macro lenses or, or if you're using extension tubes, I found that out to be the experience, uh, especially if it's a bug that you can't get super close to. And especially if you're trying to use this eye tracking focus, when you're talking about little bitty, tiny beady eyes on these bugs, the camera can't always figure that out. And so if I'm going to use autofocus, typically I use that single point focus with the surround sensors going, or a lot of times I'll just turn the autofocus off altogether especially if it's a bug or a plant where I can get close to and just use my body to lean in and out uh, to achieve focus. Takes a little bit of practice, but that's kind of, that's all about the learning process. And then flash works well to freeze the action. So if you've got a bug moving around a lot, flash is good to, to just dump a lot of light on the subject. You can shoot with smaller apertures to get more depth of field. And, uh, and you still worry about the shutter speed, but with flash, you don't worry as much about it because it works well to freeze the action. Sharon makes the comment that Loom Cube has a camera mount with a little ball head. Yeah, I've got all, that whole setup, Sharon. I've just never used it for macro, but it's, I'm going to try it because it'd be a good one. And uh, Stan says, Costa Rica, you're going to Costa Rica, I think it'd be useful for snakes and frogs. Yeah, I think, and take your 100 millimeter macro as well. I think all that sounds reasonable. The thing I don't know about on those frogs, because when I was in Costa Rica, we were there during the dry season. And the frogs weren't around that much is I don't know. I don't have a good sense of how close you can get to the frogs. Uh, you might send Ben Blankenship an, an email for that to ask him that question uh, on, on how close you can get. But if you've still got a working distance and you probably will, because my guess is if you're there on a workshop and you've got six other people with you, all they are trying to get pictures of the same frog. So using extension tubes will allow you that extra working distance to be able to get pictures of that frog without having to be right up on it. And so, uh, and then like wildlife, shoot at eye level. And that's one of the harder things to do, but I still strive to do it is shoot these animals at eye level with it because I think it just makes for a more intriguing, intriguing picture of the animal. And then, uh, I also try to shoot at higher ISOs and I don't mean crazy high, like 25,000, but 1600, the R5 I use, and I know the, the uh, sensors are getting better and better. But typically, R5 will handle 1600 ISO good. And what that higher ISO allows me to do is shoot at a higher shutter speed at a smaller aperture. And so, and then someone asked a question about this earlier. Uh, tripods aren't always necessary. Now, this will be the one time I may argue against tripods because I'm a, I'm a big advocate of using tripods, especially telephoto lenses. But if that animal is moving around a lot, the tripod is going to be hard to deal with. And so what I do is shoot at higher ISOs, use a flash if I need to, turn off autofocus, take lots of pictures, and I do all those things I mentioned before. And then just you just try to get as close as I can and let the animals get comfortable with me and just try to be nimble and move around quite a bit. 
Uh, Rick says that a friend of mine uses a cell phone flashlight to shoot pictures of, of frogs in Panama. He was impressed. Yeah. Anything that'll bounce, that'll put a little light in there. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, I mentioned reflector earlier and I, and when I was out taking pictures of that spider, I didn't have a reflector. I used a piece of paper. Works just as well. Anything you can think of that where you need to put light on that subject, whether it's a phone, loom cube, flash, reflector, whatever, it all works the same. Uh, Marina, is it better to, says, is it better to use large apertures for macro F8 to F10? I, I don't know better at all. From my perspective, it depends on what your aesthetic look you're trying to do. Uh, like these shots like this of this bare root in Smoky Mountain National Park. I like it where, where the background is a little cluttered and the background goes out of focus. So I probably shot this at F4. Now there are some cases where you need, and I'll show you one in a minute, where you need to shoot more like F8 or F10 to get more of the animal in focus. And I'll do that accordingly. But usually it's it's just a case of a, of a, of kind of what I want the picture to look at when I'm taking it. So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule to say there's a best aperture. It's kind of what's the best aperture it works for you. Like I said earlier, I usually started a more of a wide open aperture and I kind of work my way down from there depending on what it, what it looks like. Because one thing I haven't learned is it's a little hard for me to predict. I can, I can, I've taken enough pictures with my 500 millimeter telephoto lens or my 16 to 35 to kind of know in my mind the aperture I need before I take the picture. But with macro and it changes all the time with different subjects, I don't have that imprinted in my mind just yet. So I always start wide open and kind of work my way from there. Like this, uh, uh, the cool thing about macro is how it opens up a world. Like this, this is a dwarf iris that's in the Smoky Mountain National Park. And so that was shot with that, that 15 millimeter macro. But I, I like this picture because I like the sky and the trees in the background. And it gives that picture a good sense of place on where, where that flower lives. And by the way, those flowers are like that tall. They're not very big at all. Uh, Pat, he's on here. He can attest to that. And then, uh, or it, allows you to see an unseen world this picture here is of a cotton leaf and it's on the underside of a cotton leaf and i use an external flash on the other side to give it a punch of light to be able to to shine through and because leaves are translucent what's cool is you can see the whole cellular structure inside that leaf that you can't see with your naked eye and on top of that you can also see the stomata now i'm going to press you to remember what you learned in 10th grade biology but the stomates are is, is like the the mouth of the plant where the mouth takes in uh, CO2 and, ex and, and, and uh, expels oxygen. And so those little black spots inside each one of those little, uh, those little black spots you see on the leaf, those, those, that's the stomata of that cotton leaf. And, and I didn't, couldn't even see it with my naked eye, but when I took that picture, I saw that I was just, I'm still blown away by that picture when I see it. Oops. I went hit the button too many times. So this is a still undetermined bug that I, I don't know of, but to go back to Marina's question, this picture I shot at like F5.6. I just wanted that really shallow depth of field. Uh, I've got a pretty good depth of field on the leaves, but if you notice is even as it gets back towards the back of that bug's legs, uh, that that is starting to get out of focus. So really all I was concerned about was its eyes and whatever's around its eyes were in focus. Even its antenna that's in front of the uh, the head are a little bit out of focus as well, but I wanted that really creamy out of focus background. It's it's not rocket science. If you look at the way I take pictures, if you go all the way back to that hummingbird picture that I took, I just like the way that looks right there. And so that's why I always try to go for a wide open aperture. I like the subject to be in focus or the eyes to be in focus and the background to be really really out of focus. Some people may not like that, and that's cool too. But that's the way I like it to look. So that's why I always start with the wide open aperture. And then a couple more. Pat may correct me on this one, but I think that's a distant facilia on the left in Smoky Mountain National Park. Again, a small flower, beautiful though, but that that 15 millimeter macro allows me to get in close and really really shoot an environmental portrait of flowers where before all I was shooting were just more portrait kind of just tight shots of the of the blossoms. But this this uh this one here that lens will allow you to do shots like that. And I, I was probably two inches, three inches from these flowers when I shot that picture. And then the picture on the right, that's the, we call them cotton spiders, but they're an orb weaver. It's the same same spider as that one. I actually found one that I could, 
Oops, I didn't know I was I forgot I was gonna have to go back to do all this. I actually found one of those spiders on a uh, with a web on some grass, and and using the, the most important photographic tool, the noodle between my ears, I knew I could go back and line it up when the sun was uh, starting to sink, and so I shot a silhouette of it like that, and that's uh, that was shot with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens using extension tubes. And so you're able to get the sun kind of a life-size look. It's not a little bit dot. If I was to shoot this with a 50 millimeter lens or a 15 millimeter lens, the sun would have been a little bit dot. So I had to go up on you on my lens power to get the sun where it looks more of a life-size style uh, or where it looks more life-size in the image. And the uh, I like the results. I think it came out great. The uh, by the way, for reference, outside of macro photography, didn't know if you knew this or not, but for the moon or the sun to look natural in your pictures, you've got to shoot it at least 200 millimeters for it to look natural in the pictures. Anything, that that's where it looks to our eye when you're shooting a picture of a landscape with the moon or sun in it. To our eye, it looks most natural at 200 millimeters. Anything bigger than that looks magnified. Anything smaller than that looks like a dot. And this is some trillium again, kind of same shot of it. Uh, and when I, so this is the, the spring in the Smoky Mountains trip was the first trip I used this lens on. And I came, I fell in love with it as a way to shoot pictures of flowers and show them like, again, to keep, I keep beating a dead horse with this, but to put them more in an environmental type portrait, just to kind of show, give a little bit of a hint, even though it's out of focus, give a little bit of a hint on the kind of habitat these plants live in. Uh, Chris says 200 millimeter or macro. Uh, if you're talking about shooting pictures of the moon or the sun to make them look natural, it that'd be a regular lens or a macro lens too, Chris. Uh, and then this is a little guy I found hiding in the, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. I was taking pictures of this one. Those are actually black eyed peas uh, leaves that that bug is on. And then we hit, we have this conversation from time to time on the BCJ trips because I'm always curious to know in the South, and it may be this way in parts of other part in other parts of the country as well, but in the South every day or every New Year's Day, and I've done it my whole life, we eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day, uh, and so we grow a lot of black eyed peas around here now. The the legend is black eyed if you eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day it'll give you good luck. I think that's primarily a southern kind of tradition. It may be done to some extent outside the South, but we grow a lot of black eyed peas. So I was taking a picture of that one bug on the black eyed pea leaf. Looked to the left and saw this little jumping spider staring back out at me. And uh, he's a he's a cute little guy, and I fell in love with him. So I spent a little bit of time taking pictures. This is an example where you shoot lots of pictures. About half the pictures I took, his eyes aren't in focus. And so I wanted that really shallow depth of field. So when you look at the picture, it really focused on its eyes. And so I took a lot of pictures and ended up with about half of them in focus. But look at the detail you get. If he would stand closer, that'd be a good candidate for getting a really, really, really tight shot of the iridescent green that he has on his, uh, I forgot what those little pincher, those little teeth are called. Uh, but anyway, but you can get the, you see the highlight in his eyes and that, that's a good wildlife photo, whether you're talking a, 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 a little a little uh, spider that's maybe half an inch long or you're talking about an, an elephant in Botswana. That's That's got all the elements of a good wildlife picture. Oh, Chris says, don't forget the ham hocks for those peas. We usually cook our peas, Chris, with uh, in salt pork when we cook ours. So like I said, we love, we love black-eyed peas around here. I've got a whole garden full of them. But the cool thing about black-eyed peas is they bloom all summer long. And they're good for the soil because they're a legume and they put nitrogen back into the soil. And because they bloom all summer long, I can go out there right now and there's a million different beneficial bugs that are on those plants right now. These jumping spiders actually kill the harmful bugs. And so there's bumblebees, there's yellow jackets, there's honeybees, all kinds of pollinators flying around out there. And so that's why I say with macro photography, you don't have to travel far. Really, I can keep myself busy every day by walking 30 yards out to my pea patch and being able to take pictures of, of all kinds of bugs there. So it's a it's a great way to uh, try something new in photography. It's a, something I found. It always mystified me a little bit. It, and I know other people, it mystifies them because there's so many technical terms surrounding it. 
But I hope in this presentation, I've done a good job of uh, not making it too technical because, again, I'm not a super technical person. All I care about is when I turn my key, that engine starts and my truck will take me somewhere. Same way it is with this. So I don't rely on complicated charts or complicated magnification terms. I go out and I just try to take nice pictures of the things that surround me and things that make me happy and things like this jumping spider make me happy. So with that said, are there any other questions that anybody has? Sandy says, we need to see shots of your farm sometime. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll give an incessant plug right here. If you go to wild, if you go to wildlifephotoshow.com, you can there's a bunch of videos on there and a bunch of them are shot here on the farm. So you can see what the different places around looks like. Uh, that's a quick way to see it. And again, it's wildlifephotoshow.com. Go there, subscribe. You'll get a notification every time we have new videos and also subscribe you to a, a newsletter that I put out every month that has little tips and tricks and techniques. Talks about my workshop schedule with BCJ that's coming up. If you want to jump in on any of those. Talks about my speaking schedule. By the way, you are the first ones to hear this, but I'll be speaking at the North American Nature Photography Association Annual Summit in uh, in uh, uh, Arizona this coming up spring. So if anybody goes to that, feel free to, to come by and say hello and look forward to meeting you guys. Uh, wait, Dolly says, I didn't answer this question. I'm not sure which question I didn't answer, Dolly. So if you'll rephrase the question, I'll... Uh, I'll answer it for you. And then Martin says, any comments regarding extenders versus extension tubes? Yeah, the extenders, Martin, won't they won't affect your minimum focusing distance of your lenses. So all they'll do is magnify the subject, but they won't let you get closer. Like with the with the uh, hummingbird picture I showed you a picture of earlier, I, to, to get the hummingbird bigger in the frame, if I use the, the extension, I mean, if I use the tele-extender, I would still have to bend back 15 feet. No, 15. I think the minimum focusing distance lens is 13 meters. So that's what, roughly 30 feet, 30 something feet. So I had to be back that far from that little bitty hummingbird that's that tall. And so use, using the uh, using the the uh, extension tubes, I was able to get 10 feet away from it. So, uh, and I still had the extender on. So they both work together. And then Chris says, uh well that's good to hear he says he's beginning to do lots of macro in my garage you've inspired me to get out more you know that's the thing chris is the more macro you do and if it gives you a chance to take pictures more and more the more you're going to be practicing those basics of good photography and those basics translate whether you're shooting macro or whether you're shooting wildlife or, the, or landscapes or whatever uh thanks carolyn i hope that was a good intro and then Cade or pat says see you in Cade's cove in late october I'll be hollering at you, Pat. I really look forward to that. And it's always great seeing you when we get out that way. Uh, okay, so Dolly asks, so if you're in wildlife and macro when shooting lots of photos in burst mode, do you worry about how many photos it uses up on your camera? I have an R6. I, I really don't because, you know, if you, if you ever shot on film like I used to and you're relegated to 36 pictures and it was a financial sting every picture you would take uh, when digital came out, if it's something questionable, I just take lots of pictures because that's cheap insurance. I'll just take lots and lots and lots of pictures as I go along. I've actually adopted a new strategy for dealing with pictures a lot quicker. You're all the first ones to hear this too. I, who knows? I may end up doing a webinar on this on workflow. But Lightroom, I use it like a lot of y'all do. Probably most of y'all do. And it's great. But the thing that always dissatisfied me with Lightroom because I've got such a huge catalog of images is Lightroom is not the fastest at rendering. And so... It would take me, you know, it, and it's a it's a numbers game. So you may think, well, it takes four seconds to render a picture or three seconds to render a picture. And I've got a fast computer. And with these high resolution images, it would take probably two to three seconds to render an image. And so with that said, when you're looking at like I went to when I went to Botswana this year, I shot thirty six thousand images. And if you're looking at three seconds per image and do the math, that's a lot of time you're waiting for images to render. Well, what I've started doing just this past week to deal with that backlog of pictures from not only Botswana, but also Katma, uh, an interior Alaska trip and Katma again, I had 60,000 images I had to go through. And so, I, and I've always had this program for a while. So I developed a new workflow for myself where I use Photo Mechanic to go through these pictures first because Photo Mechanic can't do any of the editing like you do in Lightroom. 
but as a first pass to just delete the bad pictures and keep the good ones, it will render your pictures instantly. And so I'll go through using photo mechanic, delete the bad ones. And again, I can go into my workflow and be more specific, but that's a no, another webinar for another day. But I'll delete the bad ones. And then once I've got the bad ones deleted, I'll then import all of those into Lightroom. And I know once I do that, those are my keepers and I can move a little bit slower on those anyway. Uh, let me see, because I saw a couple more questions come in. Uh, well, I appreciate that, Kim. She said I was an amazing teacher. And I, for y'all, those of y'all that didn't know, I used to be a high school teacher. So I've got a little bit of practice in teaching. But I always like when I hear that from people because I've said it before and I'll say it again. You're looking at the you're looking at the entire photography enthusiast community of Dodd City, Texas, and when I have a chance to talk photography with other people, I love doing it and I love teaching photography. Uh, and Dolly says, "Oh, do you worry about the wear and tear on your camera from taking so many pictures?" I I really don't because I mean this is a simplistic way of putting it, Dolly. But I bought that camera to use it, and so uh, I, I either use it or I don't if it if it wears out. And here's what I think too. And some of you guys may can back me up on this one. If you go back and look at, uh, if you go back and do a, a shutter a shutter count on your cameras, you know, like I've got a, the, the best example I have is I've got a Canon uh, 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 5D Mark II. I went blank on the name for a second. I wanted to say R5, but that wasn't right. I've got a Canon 5D Mark II that's probably a 10 or 12 year old camera. Everybody, all the literature says that camera is good for 100,000 cycles, shutter cycles. And when I ran my, uh, when I ran my, the shutter count on it just a couple of months ago, I've shot 325,000 pictures with that camera and it's still going strong. And so I don't really worry about whether I'm going to wear the camera or not, because again, that's what I bought them for was to use them. And so uh, I'd rather use them and, and be able to bring some joy to my life. Not the only thing that brings joy to my life, but photography brings a lot of joy to me. I'd rather use them and then wear them out prematurely and just go get another one, buy a used one. Or, or that's another good idea. If you want to try macro, go buy a used camera because you can buy a used cameras really cheap. I, so I don't worry about that stuff. Uh, let me think. Do you use, Jerry asked the question, do you, you use focus shifting to keep all the subject in focus. That's one of those advanced techniques I haven't tried yet, Jerry, because I know for a lot of static subjects, people are using focus stacking. And so uh, I haven't really used that yet because everything I've been taking a picture of is really fast moving. And so I'm just, I just take a lot of pictures and hope to get one or two in focus. Uh, and Catherine says, good presentation. I appreciate, I appreciate that, Catherine. Uh, Chris photo mechanic. Yeah, it's an app that I use on my desktop and laptop. And I think it's, uh, I'm not gonna, if I can get my phone turned on, just do, just do a, uh, Google search for photo mechanic. It's really reasonably priced. And, uh, a lot of sports, I found out about that because a lot of sports shooters use it. And when they're having to do, you know, if someone's out at a Dallas Cowboy football game, for example, and they're taking thousands and thousands of pictures, that they've got to get turned around and out to the blogs and to the websites really quick. They use photo mechanic because it's so much faster at rendering the pictures that they just use it as just as an, a, just a culling device. And I know photo mechanic has a new version out now called photo mechanic plus. I haven't tried it, but it gives you database capabilities like Lightroom does, but I'm just telling you hands down photo mechanic. It's in a whole different league than Lightroom when it comes to just rendering the previews of your pictures. I mean, it's instant. As fast as you can hit the next button, you've got a full res preview of your picture that it's showing. I, and I'm not a computer scientist. That's like everything else I've been talking about. I don't care how it works. I just know it works. But the bottom line is those uh, 60,000 pictures, I was able to plow through and get rid of all of my calls. No joke. I'm not lying when I say this. I'm not exaggerating. I spend about two days, two evenings, about two and a half hours per evening. So five hours in all, I spent going through those pictures and getting, getting rid of the calls. If I'd have done that on Lightroom, it would have taken me a couple of weeks to do it. And so, you know, when time is money, I'd rather be out taking macro pictures than I would uh, uh, looking at the pictures on, on the, just waiting for pictures to render on my computer. So Steve says he bought a Nikon 105 millimeter one-to-one is adjustable, but an autofocus uh, 
No, one to five and one to four in defeating the purpose of macro, Steve, because I think you can get uh because pictures like that picture is one to one, but a picture like that one right there, that's not one to one. And so I think you still you, you can still use it like that and still be able to to uh take some intriguing images. I, I think it's it's just a matter of what you you're kind of looking for and what you want to see. And I'll still I'll keep answering questions as long as you guys want to ask them, but uh, if, if, if you don't have my email address, there's my email address. If you want to send me any further questions, I always answer emails. So sometimes I may be a day or two late getting to them, but I always respond, uh, every now and then just be warned if it's a complicated question and it's going to take me a while to answer. I may just ask for your phone number and give you a call back instead. Cause, uh, second behind, behind photography, I like telling stories and talking to people. So if, uh, if you guys have any further questions, feel free to reach out. Always glad to talk about this stuff. Always glad to help you out in your photographic journeys because uh, the learning always goes two, two ways. You're not the only one learning. I learn a lot from you guys and, and what you do. And to give you a good example, Bruce, you remember how much time I spent looking at your camera strap when we were in Katmai? When I got home, I bought me a camera strap. And by the way, I, I bought it used because they have used camera straps on that uh, on that on that website, uh, peak design website, they sell used camera straps. So I bought me a used camera strap. So instead of paying $75 for that strap, I paid $50 and you can't even tell it's used because it came with all the tabs and everything else. But thanks for the recommendation on that. That's something I learned from you to be specific. And, uh, it's a great strap and I've enjoyed it. And then Martin says, any comments on the use of screw up post-up lenses? Uh, I, you know, I that I mentioned that earlier, Martin. I've never really used those screw-on close-up lenses before, uh, so I I don't I, I've I've always used extension tubes or something else. So I don't have a whole lot of experience on those things. My dog's barking for some reason, uh, so I, I've never tried them. I, so if you want to try them, I, I'd be interested in seeing your experience with them. Like I said, I know some people swear by them. I just don't have a lot of experience, so I can't speak intelligently about them. And uh, Jeff, can't wait to see you again. Uh, it was good hanging out with you when we were together back in back in uh, late March and early April. That was a great trip we went on. All right. I don't think I have any other questions going in. So as always, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm about to, about to be out in the field for a little bit. And so I think my next webinar is coming up in October. And I want to say that's a... Uh, wildlife image review so if uh if you guys have any wildlife images or any macro images of bugs i'll go ahead and make the determination right now throw those in there as well because i'd love to see them uh and uh i'll see you guys down there oh by the way martin says good luck to speech at the conference appreciate that and uh, another thing you'll be hearing too if you live in texas i'll be speaking at the georgetown photography festival coming up i believe in march of this year so it, uh, I was sharing this with the people on the Katmai trip. The, some of the people that were there on the Katmai trip is I used to do a lot of speaking events until COVID came around. And then that just pretty much destroyed all of my speaking events I did. But it's all coming back now. So my speaking calendar is starting to fill up quite a bit. And it's always good to get out and meet new people and, and uh, see some of you guys and put faces with the name. So if you, if you live in Texas, you're interested in the one in Georgetown. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that coming up. If you live in uh, Arizona or if you're a member of Nampa, uh, I'll be speaking at their conference coming up in, in the spring. So anyway, talk to you guys soon. Talk to you soon, Pat. Can't wait to see you again. You guys take care.